Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 50th episode of the Energy is Love podcast. Today, our regular host, Craig Salazar, is going to take a turn as our interviewee, and I, his favorite and oldest child, have the opportunity to interview him. My name is Gwendolyn Salazar, and this is the podcast for the universe. As always, you can find each and every episode of this podcast at energyislovepodcast.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. If you haven't already, you can also subscribe and review the podcast on iTunes. Of course, we want to benefit as many people as possible, so don't forget to tell your friends about us. This episode is brought to you by our sponsor, As Above, So Below, located in Roy, Utah. As Above, So Below is a metaphysical shop, and they have everything you need for your spiritual exploration. They also host events and classes, including an upcoming one on December 17th, a spellcraft workshop. You can find the link to As Above, So Below and all of our other sponsors on our website. Just click the Sponsors tab, follow the link to the Facebook page, and check them out. In addition, every episode of the podcast is brought to you by the Crystal Water Float Spa. They're located in Tooele, Utah. Crystalwaterfloat.com, and you can find them on Facebook at Crystal Water Float Spa. Crystal Water is the nation's only distributor of the Dream Pod, so when you're ready to open your own center, contact them to get it shipped directly to your door. On today's episode, episode 50, Craig Salazar will be telling us about his path to becoming an evolution coach and podcast host. Here we go! You're listening to the Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is the love podcast. The Energy is Love podcast. Energy is love. The Energy is Love podcast. The podcast for the universe. The Energy is Love podcast. Hi, Craig. How are you? Hello, Miha. How are you? Good. I'm super excited to be here. What's it like to be on the other side of the table for once? It's really, really fun. Yeah. I was way excited when we uh, had this whole idea to do it this way. I think it's a really neat thing, and I was really looking forward to it. So I'm Me excited. too. Okay, so I want to start off with a super serious question that I'm sure everyone is wondering. If you were abducted by aliens, how would you explain to them? They have no knowledge of any of our religion or culture or anything, how do you explain to them what you do for a living? How would I explain to aliens what I do for a living? Yes. Um, that is a really deep question, sweetheart. Uh, Start off strong, right? Yeah, I don't know if I would go through the effort of trying to explain what I do for a living with aliens that have no knowledge. If you don't, they will eat your brains. Okay, so it's a requirement. <laughs> Absolutely. Um well, what level of intelligence do they have? Like, do they have, like, can I just speak normally? Do I have to find some way of communicating them with them, like, through written word or... They use Google Translate. <laughs> so they have the app downloaded so they can understand what I'm saying. <laughs> <You're dark. laughs> um, what I would do is probably help them to understand that essentially at the core of what I do is help people. Just... Uh, through guidance and through um, advice. I know, that, I mean, it's dumbing it down in a sense, but it's really just helping people. So people are stuck in life, people are struggling, and helping them see outside of their situation, see their life from a different point of view and perspective, from a different angle, and then ways that they can maximize and achieve not just financial things or uh, but really maximize and achieve their highest and greatest good and purpose in life so that they can find the most joy and happiness in everything that they do Some, somehow we would get the aliens to understand as soon as you asked the question it made me think of uh, that wonderful skit from snl with kate mckinnon uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so one more hypothetical for you. So you and I are just at the supermarket, and we're in line together, and I'm a super nosy old lady. You remind me of my grandson, so I ask you way too many questions. So we just met. We've only got these 10 minutes before I check out, and you never see me again. How would you explain yourself and your life to me? Why am I explaining myself and my life to the nosy lady at the checkout stand? Because you're my nervous grandson and you're so sweet and she wants to hear about your kids and what you do and your family. What would you say? Well, that's probably where I would start. I would, you know, I've got four kids, happily married to a wonderful woman. Um, I divide my time up doing a bunch of different things that I'm really passionate about and that I enjoy. Such as? 
such as the podcast. Obviously, the podcast is a big one, and we love doing it. Um, I say we. I, I catch myself all the time when I'm doing things for the show and whatnot. I kind of refer to it in that. What would that be called? That's not like first person, third person. Just like a plural sense. Yeah. <laughs> Instead of very much singular me. Um, but yeah, I do the podcast and that's a big thing. Um, it's a lot of fun. Um, Steph and I do the whole evolution coaching thing, helping people, uh, kind of the same explanation that I'd give her the same explanation I give the aliens. So when she asks what exactly an evolution coach is, what do you say? So it stems from a belief and an understanding really at the core of it, that people are always in a constant state of evolution where we're always perpetually moving forward in life, even though it doesn't feel like it at times, even though a lot of times we feel stuck. Or like we're moving backwards. Mm. Or that we're moving backwards. Um, we believe that we're always evolving, that that's kind of the makeup of the universe where people are always in that constant state of evolution. And so <clears throat> what we do is we help people recognize not necessarily they don't have to suddenly take that belief on in order to kind of achieve anything but the concept and idea that the things that you feel like are holding you back past traumas past experiences uh all the anxiety and stress and the fear that people have surrounding those things and the way that they avoid looking at them and dealing with them nine times out of ten those are really the issues that are keeping people stuck in all aspects of life and so People may have success in one area or success in another area, but uh, across the broad spectrum, very, very few people, I think, find joy and happiness in everything that they do because at the core of it, it's really about joy and happiness within your heart and within your life. And so helping people kind of wade through that in a sense and see it from a different perspective and understanding and then put some pieces together and really just guide them along the way. I mean, it's there's advice and there's recommendations and there's thoughts and ideas that we kind of provide. But in the end, it's, it's up to the person, right? It's up to the individual to make the choice to change and embrace that evolution that's going on so that they can really reach their highest potential. I'm sure that old woman would tell you you're a lovely young man. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and she would, she'd smile and nod and then walk out and, you know, and talk about how crazy you are to all her cats. Exactly. <laughs> so speaking of evolution, you've got to meet a lot of people with a huge spectrum of beliefs throughout doing the podcast and your spiritual journey. What are yours? What things of spirituality have you really connected to? You'd say you believe in which ones maybe seem a little bit less likely to you or you're not as connected with. Well, you know, one of the reasons I was looking forward to doing this, Miha, is because I was sitting and thinking about it and it's like, there's only very, very few people that know me as long and as well as you do. You're 17 years old and I've been your dad for a long, 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 long time. And so you really know me. And I really, uh, I think that's a neat thing. And so my guess is hopefully that I've expressed some of these thoughts to you and you're just asking for the benefit of the listeners. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, but when it comes to my spiritual belief, it's based around the idea. That's why it's the energy is love podcast. Because at the core of what I believe, um, the universe spins on energy and we're all connected through that energy. And that energy is really in not just each individual, but in everything that exists, not just on this planet, but in the universe as a whole. And that that energy is what binds us and connects us, us all, connects us, us. <laughs> and through that energy, we... I mean, it, it's it's the existence of life, and it's just love. It's just pure. It's not good or bad or indifferent. It's just love. I know we label love as a positive thing, right? I'm saying it's just love. It's not the hate, hate is podcast, or energy is hate podcast. Um, but I think that it's a very high vibration of energy, meaning that it's it's pure and it's unadulterated. It's just exists in the form that it is. And so that's the basis for my belief system, I guess, my um, kind of belief in regards to why we're here and the passion of life is really just to embrace that love, allow it within our own hearts, love ourselves uh, first and foremost, 
and I think that people struggle with that concept and idea, thinking that it's somehow selfish or that if you're loving yourself, then you aren't focused on the other people in your life that you love. And it's one of those things that I try to express to you guys, meaning uh, you and your sisters and your siblings. And um, it's like you have to love yourself first. When I say you have to love yourself the most, ideally you just love everything the most, like everything is at the same level. But you have to love yourself first. And if you can do that, then it makes life so much easier in all regards and all different aspects because it just gives you such a sense of peace that fear doesn't really become an issue anymore. And when fear does pop up, you can kind of move through it a little bit easier because at the core of it, you know that you're worthy. You know that you're worthwhile. You know that, you know, all the things that people commonly struggle with, whether they're adequate enough, whether they're good enough, whether they are going to be judged for this or judged for that, all of those things fall apart and disappear when you really have a firm basis in who you are as a person and you love that person. So I don't think it's selfish to love yourself and I don't think it's selfish to love yourself first, meaning that it's not that you put yourself first in every single situation or scenario, but it's like if you were to take a child and teach them to first love themselves and then they would be so much better suited to love other people and life in general and experiences. And so that's the idea is it, I mean, that's what I mean by love yourself first, not that you're going to put yourself before your family or your children or your spouse, but that you're really, you'll be better at loving them because you don't feel like you're constantly in need of receiving it from them. You can just focus on dishing it out to everybody else. Exactly. Yeah. Unconditional love flows so much easier once you kind of have it within your heart and that's why I think it's important to love yourself first. Well, that's that's a big, t- like a big concept in the realm of what I believe, and and then it, you know you can dive into any rabbit hole of you know do I believe in chakras? Yeah, I believe in chakras. I believe that we have energy centers located in our bodies in different spots, and I think they all are interconnected, and I think that they have a correlation with physical aspects and spiritual aspects and emotional aspects and all of those aspects are interconnected and correlated together. And, you know, I believe in all sorts of wonderful, crazy, bizarre things because what happened along the way of learning about all of these different things was I got to a point where uh, I believe that the universe is bigger than infinite, that it's goes on much farther and further than we can possibly imagine. And in that space, there's enough room that everything can be possible. And so it's silly for me to question or doubt somebody else's belief or somebody else's idea when they very well, I think everybody is right in the end. Well said. (laughs) Okay. So since I do know you and also just because this is something all humans go through, Mm -hmm. kind of tying into that core value of yours, since it was for everyone such a long journey to be able to love yourself and reap the benefits from that. Tell us a little bit about your journey to loving yourself, but also just how that ties into your journey to spirituality. Do you feel like it just started a few years ago? Do you feel like it really started when you were born and you just didn't realize that that's what it was? Because you've had a variety of careers. This isn't the only job that you've done. So kind of tell us how those all tied in, how you got where you are now, and maybe even where you see yourself in the future. Looking back, it's always easier, right? It's really easy to look back over your life and see the correlating, connecting pieces. And if I look back now, I can see how I was always spiritual. Um, Just didn't realize it or understand it for what it was. I can also see time periods in my life where I was really disconnected from that spirituality. And same thing, I didn't realize it at the time. Um, But I think my journey and my path has always been the, the one that it's supposed to be. I think that that's the same for everybody. I think we're always exactly where we are supposed to be. And we're always on that path, even though at times it feels like we deviate from it or that we choose a different path in life. I think the reality is that I don't necessarily think our life is predestined. I think that we are literally just always where we are supposed to be. And it's in correlation and connection with that big universal spin of energy kind of guiding and working in um, 
a symbiotic relationship essentially with our energy and that energy because it's all the same energy but what were you gonna say so if i choose something does that become the right choice or did i choose it because it was the right choice i don't think there's a wrong or a right choice i think that we label them wrong and right i think that we sit and deliberate over a choice and weigh the options of this or that or the other, the pros and the cons, and is this going to be the right decision or is that going to be the right decision? And in the end, there is no wrong or right decision. Life and everything just simply exists as is. And it really boils down to how we respond and react to those decisions. So there's a lot of decisions throughout my life that would be very easy for me to look at and label as bad decisions or negative decisions. And there's also a lot of really good decisions that I feel like I've made over my life. Um, but for me to go back and look and judge it or label it and get stuck in kind of the frustration over shame associated with this decision or stress or anxiety or whatever the case may be. It doesn't really serve a purpose at this point in life. And it's not me being ignorant or oblivious to my past and just trying to ignore it and move on. It's really acceptance of this higher thing that at the core of it, it's how I react to not just decisions I make, but experiences sometimes that happen to me. Because a lot of times we feel like there's things that happen to us that we don't really get to choose, right? And I think that um, the decisions that we make aren't good or bad. I think they just are. And Why do you say that that same theory applies to people? Meaning there aren't good and bad people? Absolutely. I don't think there's evil. I don't think that there's people out there that are so inherently evil and despicable and do you know what I mean? I think I don't think the world is full of hate. I think the world is full of energy, and it's not until we choose to label it hate. Um, we could say the same thing about love, where we don't, you know, we just label it love, but there's a different feeling associated with it. And so it could be a naive viewpoint. You know, I'm sure there's plenty of people that look at it. I'm sure there's times that you look at your dad and think that he's just being naive. As every teenage girl does. Yeah. You know, to a certain extent where a choice of not looking at, you know, good and bad and evil and all those kind of things. But it really is looking at things from a higher perspective, from a higher point of view, I feel. And it's not that I'm any more enlightened than in the next person. It's just really the idea and the belief that at the core of everything, it just simply is. It just exists. And it's up to us to choose how we let it affect us and move us and perceive it. Does that make sense? I think so. I don't know if that answered any question that you possibly asked. But I thought it was great. Good. So can you think of any direct ways that your upbringing affected your path to spirituality? Um, very much so. You know, I think about, uh, I think it's important for everybody throughout their life at some point to kind of go back and rehash their upbringing and their childhood. Um, I don't think that means that you have to go back and relive experiences or sit and dwell on the negative things that we would label negative or things like that. You know, you know, my childhood for the most part, you know, my, you know, obviously your grandparents for heaven's sake. I know. have met them a time or two. Yeah. Yes. So you have a pretty good idea of what my childhood was to a certain extent. However, you don't really have any idea what it was like. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. And the same could be said for me and you. I can look at your life and I've been here with you the entire time and I have a really good sense of what your childhood and your upbringing and your life was. But at the same time, I don't have any idea because it's you experiencing it. You and your sister have a completely different experience of your childhood and your upbringing. And so I look at my life. I look at my childhood. I look at my, you know, our, my parents. And as I went back in time and looked at all the experiences that I went through, I can very much see how they shaped, not necessarily my spirituality, even though there were big aspects of that, but how they shaped my character. And if we think about, this is kind of a weird hippie way of looking at it, right? So you think about, you have the physical aspect of your body, you have the emotional aspect, you have the spiritual aspect, all those kind of different factors. 
I think the spiritual aspect of your body. So at the core, your energy, your soul, your chi, whatever the heck you want to call it. I think that's pure. I think that's simply just the high vibrational love that the universe spins on. I think that's what we're born as. I think that's what we always exist as just that pure form, right? And then the emotional aspect of your life, the mental aspect of your life, the physical aspect of your life, or your character, your makeup, all of those things are influenced and affected by your life experiences. Now at the core of it, your energy is always going to be pure. It's always going to be love. You can't affect that from outside forces. <sighs> but your emotional well-being, um, your physical well-being, your mental well-being, those things can very much be influenced and changed by the experiences that you've gone through. So it's like clay, right? It can be molded. It can be shifted and changed. And over time, um, because it's continually being worked on, it's a work in progress. It molds and shifts and changes into different things. And so I can very much see how physical aspects of myself, uh, mental and emotional aspects of myself have been molded and shaped and affected by the experiences that I went through as a child, as a teenager, as an adult, all those kind of different things. And so in doing so, it's really just an awareness. It's really just kind of understanding why I am the way that I am and looking for ways to bring that pure energetic aspect of my spirituality into a happy equilibrium with all other aspects of me. So incorporating them all. Does that make sense? Because there's a lot about who I am that I like. Do you know what I mean? I'm not, I'm, I don't hate myself. I'm not angry with my... And so you're doing something right then. <laughs> and so I don't think there's anything wrong with the experiences that I've gone through in my life. They've made me who I am. So I'm not trying to rid myself of them or distance myself from them. I'm really just trying to understand how they affected me then and how they continually affect me now. So speaking of your upbringing, mm -hmm. you happen to have been born to one of the most wonderful women that anyone has ever met <laughs> in the history of the world. If she uh, ends up listening to this, I love you, Grandma. But so she's always Grandma been... Grandma listens to every episode of the podcast. Of course she does. That's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. So she's always been in her own way a hippie for lack of a better term. She's always been, as long as I can remember, you know, we had the grandma tree in the backyard and all the grandkids got trees and always very into gardening and connected with the earth as well as recycling and very pure and kind. And even if it didn't have the names that we use now, the essence was always there. And also, as you said, you and your wife do things together. She's also has a really similar belief system to you. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> but in contrast, your, uh, your kids, this one especially, kind of ended up being a little skeptical. Mm -hmm. So how, this is mostly just out of my own curiosity, <clears throat> how has that affected you? Having family that agree with you, that see eye to eye with you, that kind of maybe support what you're doing a little bit more in comparison to this me who interrogates you all the time and doesn't necessarily agree with a lot of your beliefs and how has that maybe pushed you in good or bad directions if we're going to use those terms yeah those labels huh um i think first and foremost uh my mom was a huge influence on me in my life both in a positive and a negative way um i can see looking back all the wonderful ways that she was a mother the wonderful ways that she raised and provided and cared for and really, really did a wonderful job at being a, at being a mother. And then I can also see her for who she is, you know, when I can go back and remember experiences and challenges and things like that. And that's just her, right? Nobody's perfect. I'm, it's really easy for you to go back through your life and see all the ways that I screwed up as your dad. Really easy. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, that's one of the challenging things about being a parent. And so it definitely affected me uh, in a positive way. Um, it's wonderful that, you know, I remember, I know a lot of my, I guess, my my uh, innate spirituality, my connectedness, my, 
you know, the deeper belief, because I can go back and remember a lot of things from my childhood, I can definitely see correlation and connection with Grandma Mary and everything like that as far as how that played a role in who I am. Um, but you have to remember, obviously, not everybody in the family sides with or agrees with what I practice or believe in, right? And it's not that we have some sect of the family that hates us or ostracizes us or anything like that, but everybody's open to their own ideas and beliefs. Um, and yeah, it's wonderful that Steph and I align with things and that we, you know, fall on the same page when it comes to the vast majority of things, especially when it comes to spirituality and energy and things like that. Cause I think it's important to have that in a spouse. Um, and then as far as like, I just absolutely love watching you because I remember very clearly what I was like when I was your age. And it's not me looking back from the outside. Like I remember what I thought. I remembered how I felt. I remembered, you know, experiences that I went through and how they affected me and all that type of stuff. And I love that you question things. I think that's a beautiful thing. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Thank you. Um, cause we're recording in your room right now. Cause it's one of the only quiet places where we can record, but you have such a eclectic, just a beautiful space and you're so open and connected Thank you. and you just don't even necessarily, it's not that you don't realize it. It's this, that you think of it or label it in some other way, shape or form, but I can see you and see all the ways that you are open and that you're accepting and that you're loving and that you're connected. And I mean, I watch you, I watch you work with energy, even though you don't understand what you're doing and you don't label it that way, but I see you work with it. Um, I see you connect with it. Do you know what I mean? How many times are you wearing some piece of jewelry that has some crystal or stone in it? And granted, it may have been a gift from somebody or something grandma gave you or and you like it because it's pretty and it's nice, but there's also a deeper reason why you like it. And there's a deeper reason behind why you wear it and things like that. And so I think it's supernatural and normal for, especially a 17 year old girl to question her parents, to question the world around her, uh, look for what she resonates and connects with. And I always want you to do that. I don't want you just to sign up under the dotted line of what I tell you to believe because that's silly. <laughs> I mean, you know, kids that do that, you know, parents that do that to their children. And you know, our, my, my mom and dad didn't do that. Um, we didn't have that thing that we had to believe in. Um, we just had the opportunity to find it for ourselves. It wasn't the pressure to just fall into whatever was already assigned. You got to discover it. Yeah, for it's sure. It's cool that you ended up discovering the same thing, mate. Your mom did, even though she didn't pressure you into it. <laughs> well, you have to realize, too, that grandma hasn't always been the way that she is, in a sense. Do you know what I mean? Um, granted, she's always been an incredibly loving, caring person. And it's probably similar to you, where she was spiritual. She just didn't exactly. call it that yet. Yeah, everybody is. They just don't, you know, that's just how I choose to label it. That's just how I choose to look at it. But everybody has that connected portion of their... Uh, inside, I guess, you know, where they feel connected to energy. Their guts and black stuff. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, their guts and black stuff inside. And, um, it's just how I label it, but it, that doesn't make my way or my labeling or my understanding or my belief any more right or wrong than anybody else's. Do you know what I mean? We obviously know a lot of people that believe in God and religion is not just a huge thing in the community that we live in, but also in the world. It plays such a huge role in every aspect of society, and it has for hundreds and hundreds and thousands of years. But at the core of all religion, not just Christianity, is a belief in a higher power, a belief in something more. And that's the same in my belief. I'd say that's honestly my favorite thing about spirituality. I actually <laughs> excuse me, had the opportunity to give a presentation on spirituality in my uh, world religions class mm -hmm. recently. And it was just so great to get to talk about the fact that it's so synonymous. Like when I go to, as I call them, hippie conventions with you, <laughs> but really, you know, it's spiritual gatherings. Everyone always is sure to say God or whatever you call it. Or as you did in this very podcast, they'll say chi or soul or spirit or energy or whatever you want to call it. There's that super 
just embracing and accepting aura about the whole thing of you can call it whatever you want. I almost feel like spirituality is just realizing that it's all the same but under different names. Whereas other religions are constantly fighting to prove that theirs is the right one. Mm -hmm. How would you define spirituality? Um, I think that's a really good definition. Do you know what I mean? I think it's a belief in something greater than yourself. And I think that at the core of it, uh, spirituality, if we're going to label it or define it in some way, shape or form, that belief in a greater, higher power. And there's a lot of people that are spiritual that believe in God and they call it God and they refer to it as God. Um, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But I think at the core of it, and I think that's the same thing in regard to religion as well, I think at the core of it, there's a huge component and piece of it that is love. And that is, you know, do unto others as you would have done to you, and the golden rule and all that type of stuff of treating people the way that you want to be treated. And I think that's incredibly important. And when it comes to spirituality, it's a belief in something greater than yourself, but it's also a willingness to continually seek and find and question things, right? So my spiritual belief continually evolves and changes where, you know, a year ago or two years ago or three years ago, four or five years ago for that matter, um, it's vastly different than it was then. And I'm always constantly kind of looking and seeking and exposing myself to not just other people's ideas and thoughts. That's one of the cool things with the podcast is I get to hear about other people's perspectives and the way that they view it and the way that they work with energy and all that kind of stuff. Is that why you decided you wanted to do the podcast? Um, yes and no. You know, one of the biggest factors behind wanting to do the podcast was simply wanting to bring awareness to all of these different things. Um, I had met so many neat people from doing fairs and events and getting into that realm of spirituality and practicing energy work. And I wanted a way to share them and their experiences and highlight them in a sense. And the podcast just seemed like the perfect media to do that, the perfect format where I give them an opportunity to share not just what they do. So they're not just plugging, you know, their website or their Facebook page, or it's not just a hour long commercial for their business, but it's more about, um, personalizing it so that people see that the person that reads tarot cards or the person that practices Reiki or, you know, believes that crystals have healing abilities, that those people are just regular everyday, normal people who aren't crazy, who aren't, you know, wizards and warlocks and sorcerers that cast spells and, you know, and if they are, that's fine too, (laughs) but they're just normal people and the ideas and concepts aren't that crazy when you break it down and start to really look at what's behind all of them, right? Because religion has crazy things too. Religion has bizarro practices that when you look at them initially on paper or from the outside, you look at them and you're like, that is so wacky and bizarre. And every single religion has them. Even (laughs) science, I'm sure if you asked any biology student, they could tell you that there are some really confusing, crazy things that they (laughs) learn about over the course of even the most logical classes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, science, and that's another thing too, is spirituality and science can coexist so well, you know, where... You know, I talk about energy and energy connecting everything and we're all, you know, made up of the same stuff. Essentially, we have stemmed from stars, right? Stardust. And me being the skeptic that I am, love tying that into the law of conservation of energy, which so clearly states that energy is neither created nor destroyed. So if you want to tie that into spirituality, you can make the argument that, yes, it is the energy that it is us is the same energy that was there before we were born and is the same that'll be there after because by definition we can't make any more of it you don't think we can make any more of it if we're going by the laws of science then we can't make any more of it (laughs) you think there's just a hundred percent of energy on this planet or in this universe galaxy realm whatever and that's the only amount that's ever been here i think so yeah because if you want to think about it in a way that Everything that it has ever exists exists simultaneously. As I've and I've met a lot of people who are spiritual who do believe that not even necessarily in reincarnation, but just that 
it's all happening at once. That time is a human construct, essentially. And by that logic, yes, it does all exist at one time because everything is one time because there isn't a one time. That's what your dad believes. I don't believe in time. I believe everything is the now and the present and the moment. I think that everything that is happening right now, um, most likely, well, not most likely, everything that's happening right now has happened before. And when we think about time, when we think about past, like you take history in school, right, and you study about uh, times throughout history and learn all of those things, I think all of those things that you're learning about are literally happening right now. So it's weird. It's hard to kind of wrap your mind around, but... I really don't think there's a past or a future. I think there's just the now. It's definitely a fun thing to ponder. It is. And going back a little bit, I did want to say when you were mentioning how when you have people on the podcast, you try to be a little bit more personalized with them. That's why I was so excited to do this because I thought when we had the opportunity to go listen to Ira Glass, who we love from NPR, he does this American Life, if anyone was wondering. <laughs> And uh, if after this episode you feel like you need to listen to a, a better podcast, go and <laughs> check out This American Life. <laughs> he has a lot more experience than I do. But um, so Ira Glass, my wonderful father sitting across the way here, took me and we got to go listen to him speak. And it was essentially just about his life because we'd heard him so for so many years talk about other people's. And it was so nice to get to see his own perspective and what got him there. And that's what really made me want to do this episode was you with you is I feel like as a listener, if I didn't know you the way that I do, I would want to know more about who you are. So that's yeah. why I'm trying to focus on that in this episode. <laughs> no, that's a cool thing. And that was a way, way cool thing we got to do. Yeah, there. that was awesome. I hope my voice is as soothing as his. Yeah. I wish I had an Ira Glass voice. Me too. It's like he was born and they're like, son, you shall be on the radio. Amen. Mm -hmm. Or a Fred Armisen voice. That would work too since uh, <laughs> <laughs> it's the same thing. I think we've just about covered all my questions, except I do want to reiterate on this one. I kind of asked it, but I kind of asked it with about 800 other questions, so we didn't exactly get to it. Where do you see yourself, both as an individual and then in your line of work in the future? So not just five years, but 50. 50 years. Well, at the core of what I want to do with my life, at the core of what I, you know, what I kind of feel is the intention of my life is really just joy. Um, sometimes it seems like a cop out, right? It seems lazy. Sometimes I even struggle with it with myself where, what the hell does that even mean? I'm just going to, you know, I'm just going to be joyful in life and that's all that I want to do. But really, Miha, it's really, um, what is the purpose of this life? You know, why am I here on this planet? Uh, and if I love myself first and foremost, it's really easy for me to think about uh, unconditional love. And the reason it's really easy for me to think about it is because I feel like I have unconditional love for you and your sisters and your brother. And the fact is, when I think about what I would want for you, I want nothing but joy and happiness in your life and whatever you choose. And so right now I'm doing a podcast. We do evolution coaching. I love helping people. I love sitting down and kind of diving into the minutiae of people's pasts and their darkness, not because I like to like, you know, gossip about whatever shit they're going through, but so much more I like to um, help people through that space and, and then get to see them make connections and light up inside and start to see their life in such a completely different way to where they start to not just have hope, but happiness and excitement for existence and moving through life. And so that brings me joy. Uh, podcasting brings me joy. Being a father brings me joy. Um, really recognizing all the different ways in my life where I have joy and then appreciating them while they're happening, right? Because if we only have the now, if we only have the present, then that's really all that I should be worried about. There's no need for me to stress and worry about the past. And there's sure shit no reason to worry and stress about the future because who knows what's going to happen. So where am I going to be in five years? Where am I going to be in 10 years? I don't know. And I don't think it's important to know. I think it's a 
I think it's important to have goals and I think it's important to have an outlook on life as far as where I want to be going and what I want to be doing. But I don't think I have to map it out. I think at the core of it, I want to be happy. I want to be joyful. I want to be doing something that I'm not just happy and joyful about, but that I'm proud about and that I feel like is serving uh, the higher, greater purpose, right? I'm a big believer in um, helping people and serving humanity as a whole. And I know you're like... (laughs) I can only imagine the things that you're thinking. You're like, how in the hell does he think that he's doing that in any way, shape, or form? <laughs> Hopefully everybody does that. Yeah. But, um, you know, that's really, that's really what's important to me, you know. So whether, you know, whether we just still just host our podcast or, you know, I, I don't have any idea what I'm going to be doing, me, huh? But I'm okay with that. I don't have to have, I don't have to have some career or some path. Really, I just want to be doing what I love and what I'm passionate about. And as long as I'm happy and joyful in life, and as long as I feel like I'm helping people, then I'm pretty sure that I'll be that way. And I'm sure if all you know is every day you're going to wake up with the goal to smile and make life better for other people, and you can't get too wrong, right? Yeah, I think it's a good thing. So how do you think that becoming more spiritual has affected the aspects of your life that aren't directly spiritual, like being a father and work and just walking down the street on a daily basis. Well, let me ask you um, if you can think of ways that you've seen me change or if you could look at maybe not necessarily individual things that you could reference or speak on, but as a whole, kind of as a total, you know, a big picture type thing. How have you seen me change um, after I kind of came to this place of a deeper spiritual meaning behind life? I can certainly remember like specific examples. Like I know uh, we came home one day and the table and couch removed and there was a massage table in the middle of the room. We were like, hello, hi, what's going on? And you're like, this is what I'm doing now. So (laughs) welcome home, kids. Uh, Get in line. We're going to, your dad's going to dish out some massages and no one argued. So I can certainly remember things like that. But I'd say oh, <laughs> oh, <laughs> um, overall, it's probably just, hmm, I'd say more calmness overall. And I, I feel like you talk more about, not only talk more to us, just in general, like I feel like it's become more of a priority to have more of that, you know, really in- intimate connection, but maybe it's also in combination that you have more time now since you get to decide your own schedule, which is really nice. But I just feel like your priorities have switched around a little bit. And now you talk a lot more frequently about things like unconditional love and happiness being the main priority. And like, we've had conversations where I'm like, I need to go home and do homework. And you're like, no, you need to be happy. And I'm like, no, I, I need, I need to do homework and just little stuff like that, that I feel like maybe quote unquote, the old Craig wouldn't have said. Yeah. I mean, there are little things I think like that. And I, I, you know, I'm, I'm glad that you see them. I'm glad that you recognize them. I hopefully the, some of those little things kind of stick with you in a sense, because, um, that's the biggest thing. If I can impart some sense of seeking that happiness and joy inside of yourself, first and foremost, then hopefully I've done, done well by you. But as far as like, um, you know, I think I'm more peaceful inside than I ever have been before. I know that sometimes it's hard to see on the outside. (laughs) Uh, I know that sometimes it seems like I'm still just grumpy ass dad and I don't have patience and all that kind of stuff. But inside I feel much more at peace. Um, It's definitely outwardly visible sometimes. Like you said, we're sitting in my room right now and I remember when we painted my room at the old house, I was like, oh, I want to paint my room. And you're like, okay, you go sit down. I'm going to paint your room and it's going to look nice and don't talk to me while it's going on. And so, you know, it was all one color and it was, it was what I wanted, but it was, it wasn't fun. But this room, one wall is orange. One wall is green, which is something that neither you nor I a couple years ago would have been anywhere near okay with, but we've both taken some pretty great strides. And then the other two walls we just kind of had fun with. There's just 
we took sponges and just slapped them on and handprints and a little bit of finger painting on there and it was actually it was a nice memory and a nice moment to have and when now when I look at the room it might look a little bit crazier than the old one did but it's I look at it so much more fondly and I think things like that reflect the changes that you overcome thank you um that's a good example I think because I so many times I think people get caught into that space me of thinking that that shit's important. Do you know what I mean? I could care less what your room looks like. And I didn't always feel that way. I would, you know, I think I always felt that way, but I didn't practice that. I didn't express that. I didn't show that, right? I would always feel that way, but I wouldn't talk that way. And my behavior sure wouldn't reflect that. Um, it's the same thing like when I think about uh, we'll use Stevie for an example. She wants to cut her hair. She wants to dye her hair. She wants to shave her hair. She wants to do this to her hair. I don't really care what she does to her hair. You know, it doesn't change first and foremost, obviously, how I feel about her. It's not going to make me love her any more or any less. I still love her 150%. It doesn't matter what her hair looks like. And I think, you know, you'll see other kids or, you know, she'll come home and talk about so-and-so you know, wants to do that to her hair, but her parents would never let her, or, you know, the case is, I don't care what you guys do to your hair. Hair is such a silly thing to worry about because obviously your hair is going to grow back. <laughs> and um, I think free expression, first and foremost, is always a wonderful thing. And I, I mean, I struggle, you know, in that space with you guys still, even though I may think something or feel it, but it's hard sometimes as a parent and some of those old behaviors of mine will kind of creep up and jump in the way where you want to express yourself in some way, shape or form. I'm like, hell no, you're not doing that. Or it's a, it's a hard balance, but I definitely, like I said, I feel much more peaceful inside and much more, um, at peace is just such an easy way to describe it. And that's different than peaceful. Like at the end of the day, you know, you sit back with your own thoughts and with your own emotions and inside your own heart and your own head. And I remember very much how that used to feel and it felt chaos right. and it felt riddled with, um, anxiety and stress and fear and frustration. And, um, I remember very well what that feels like. And I still get that feeling sometimes, but more and more and more, it's just a sense of peace at the end of the day and throughout the day. So that's been a huge shift and change. I love the saying that tranquility is when you feel peaceful, even though you're not in a peaceful environment. I think that that's something that all of us individually have taken a lot of strides in. Being able to realize that the world around you is chaotic, but like you said, your own inner dialogue isn't. Yeah. Yeah, you really have to work at it. You know, so many things that Steph and I talk to people about, and I mean, I probably have you know, mentioned it and talked about it on the podcast 101 times, but whether it's a spiritual practice or a pretty much any aspect of life, it's practice. It's something that you have to continually work at. You know, you're an incredible student and you get, you know, amazing grades and you do all of these things that are incredibly admirable, but that's work <laughs> and that's practice. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and that's something that you have continually strived for. You know, even though there's aspects of you that are incredibly kind of naturally talented and gifted in some area or that area or whatever the case may be, everybody has those things. But at the end of the day, you know, I don't care how, I mean, well, you know, Beethoven, Mozart, some famous composer, Da Vinci, some artist or whatever the case may be, they had to work at what they did, even though they were naturally talented at it. So I just want to continue to practice life. I'm pretty good at life. I'm glad you've got, you've got a couple years under your belt, not yeah. too many, but yeah. a little bit of practice going on. <laughs> I've got a lot of practice. I've lived a lot in these 35 years. That's good. Yeah. I hope I can say the same in 18 more years. Hmm. Hmm. Do you have any other questions? Um, she has such a cute little list of questions to go through. Let's see. Aliens check. Supermarket woman check. Grandma Mary check. Uh, let's see. Which career has had the largest impact on your personal life, positive or negative? Because I can remember, just kind of tying back into how much you've changed, I can remember conversations that 
we had when you were um, working as a police officer. Hold on one sec. That I just can't imagine having with you today. Just little like yes, go way closer. Comments that you would make because you were in that mindset that now you just wouldn't say. Yeah, um, <laughs> I think first off, I haven't had that many careers. <laughs> I've had a lot of jobs, um, but I haven't had that many careers. Uh, essentially being a police officer has probably been the only career that I've had. You don't count, uh, the Pier 49 pizzeria as a career, Dad? <laughs> Do you remember, you remember Pier 49? Of course. They had the coolest stickers in there for 25 yeah, cents. I was a good pizza delivery guy. <laughs> um, no, a lot of jobs over my life, but only very few careers. And the biggest impact I think that out of any, even though all of those jobs I can go back and look at and, you know, I gained experience and benefit from and the skill set that I learned, even, you know, delivering pizzas played a role at being a police officer, uh, delivering the mail, um, being a server was a huge one. The ability to talk to people, to communicate with people and engage people. Um, that's a wonderful skill set to have just in life in general. Also dealing with awful people. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Pick that up in the food service uh, yeah. industry. Pretty Frustrated pretty. customers and all that kind of stuff. That definitely helped. Um, but being a police officer definitely affected my life most profoundly. Pretty much across the board. <laughs> Every single aspect of my life was affected by becoming a police officer. And looking back, I can appreciate it now for what it was and feel that, like I said, every aspect was affected by it. But in the long run, I think every aspect of me was positively affected by that experience. Even though, even now, I mean, we're going on like a year and a half or something like that since I left law enforcement. Um, and it's hard to see some of the ways that I was affected by being a police officer in a positive light. Um, it's a hard, hard job to have for sure. It is a hard job to have. <laughs> it's one of those jobs that, uh, that's why police officers are so tight knit. You know, that's why when you become a cop 99.9% .9 of the time, you only hang out with cops and your best friends are cops and you do cop things when you're not working. When you are working, you do cop things. And then when you're off, you go and hang out with cops. And the reason being is because I really think that to truly grasp and understand what a police officer experience is, you have to be a police officer. You can't really understand what it's like until you have actually done it. And there's a lot of people that think they understand. Uh, obviously there's a huge issue in society and the media and all that kind of stuff, trying to understand what it's like to be a police officer. But the, the person that really understands what it's like to be a cop is a cop. And I had no idea what it was going to be like. Even when I, you know, even working in the jail, I thought I would understand what it was like to be a cop and I got a pretty good taste of it. But at the end of the day, being a correctional officer is far different than being a police officer. And it affected me drastically. I'm sure you saw it. I'm sure you experienced it. Um, yeah, we'd have those conversations that we probably won't ever have again about, you know, it's funny the way that your life shifts and changes as you become a police officer and the way you view things and society and all those type of stuff. And I remember very clearly, this is one thing that's probably changed an easy, significant thing, right? Um, I remember thinking in my thought process, right? As you continue to grow up and become a teenager and all these type of things. Um, I used to take you out shooting and I enjoyed that and we had a good time and you were good. And I, you know, and it wasn't just the opportunity to get to spend that time with you, but I also had the intention and the plan and the kind of laid out in my mind where I was going to continually teach you how to shoot so that you became proficient in shooting so that you in turn could carry a gun with you so that you could get your concealed weapons permit so that you could always have a firearm with you so that you could move through life now with a gun on your hip. For the record, I was a pretty uh, dead shot, you just were. in case anyone was wondering. <laughs> you were a good shot. Um, you know, because I used to think that that was an important thing, that you were going to need a gun when you went off to college, that you were going to need a gun throughout life. And there's a lot of people that think like that, and there's nothing wrong with thinking like that. 
I don't think like that anymore. <laughs> you know, uh, I don't think it's important for you. I think it's fun to shoot and I don't think there's anything wrong with it. And I think if that's something that you get into in life, you know, as you grow up, I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But um, I don't think it's necessary. I don't think that you need to have your concealed weapons permit and carry a gun with you when you go off to college. I'm not worried about that. Um, <clears throat> some people might think that's crazy. I know that there's, do you know what I mean? A lot of the guys I used to spend time with and hang out with, all my buddies and stuff like that, uh, I think they would probably think that's crazy. But I don't. I don't think the world is that inherently bad. Uh, one of the things when you become a police officer, you just really start to shift and change the way that you view not just society, not just the individual, but the world as a whole. And everything becomes um, kind of a risk assessment where it's no longer there's a safe place. It's um, I'm just going to assess every possible risk that could take place in this scenario. You know, we used to play those what if games and I would describe things and explain that this is what happens when this happens. And I had all of those plans. And I don't really do that anymore, you know. I definitely feel like you're a lot more trusting of just the people around you in general. Not Definitely not to a naive extent. Like, uh, I don't think that that mentality will ever be completely switched. But just generally speaking, I feel like there's a lot less, like you said, of that. Constantly needing an escape plan. And, oh, I'm just seeing... I feel like the downside of being a police officer, even though you do get these wonderful experiences of seeing, and as you said, I, I don't know anything about it because I never have been one, but even though you get to, you know, to save the cat out of the tree and talk with the old lady and the little kids and all these positive stuff, you saw also a lot of just negative. And I think after so many hours of being so exposed to, if we're using labels, the, the bad people in the world, you start to think that there's a disproportionate amount of them. And then when you can step out of that and, you know, just go to the supermarket and have conversations with people and do podcasts, you get to re-realize, re oh yeah, the vast, vast majority of people are wonderful, wonderful people. And I think it's really great that you get to do that now. I think it's really great too, you know, it makes me uh, really, really happy. And um, I think there are parts of society out there that are bad, even though, you know, we're not labeling people good or bad, but there's danger out there. I'm not oblivious. I'm not naive. But like you said, the vast majority of society is good. And, you know, that was one thing that I wasn't prepared for as a police officer was not only do you see not just bad people, but the bad side of society and the things that people do to one another and the ways that people live and the ways that um, you get to see that up close and personal on such a regular basis. And then you also get to see trauma. That's one thing that you can't ever really explain to people. Um, obviously soldiers understand it for more. I have no idea what that's like. I could imagine, but I'm sure just as I describe, you know, you don't know what it's like to be a police officer unless you're a police officer. I have no idea what it's like to be a soldier or a Marine or somebody like that in war, even though I can imagine what it's like, I still have no idea what it's like to be in that experience. Um, but that was one thing that I wasn't prepared for. I didn't really know going in and they don't really prepare you for it because there's not really an adequate way to prepare somebody for traumatic experience after traumatic experience after traumatic experience. There's just not. And so in the end, Miha, that was one of the things that just kind of, um, luckily I was able to kind of see it. Do you know what I mean? Even though I, when I say I'd have like these out of body experiences, um, not in like the classic, cause we're on the energy slot podcast. So we talk about out of body experiences all the time. Right. But I would have experiences as a cop where, I would kind of be watching it from the outside, even though I was involved, even though I was doing something, even though I was right there, I would see it for, from the outside perspective of just like, oh my God, I can't believe what's happening. I can't believe that this happens in the world, right? And it's not that I'm naive. It's not that I'm oblivious, but to be involved in those type of experiences and see them so closely and so routinely, right? 
it was just so profound. I mean, that makes such huge impacts on people and nobody really, <laughs> nobody understands it. Nobody's doing anything about it too. That's the other frustrating thing was, you know, there's not help out there for police officers who suffer from uh, post-traumatic stress disorder. Even though it's almost inevitable in that line of work. Well, you know, hopefully the, <laughs> I always hate talk about, I always hate talking about being a cop, not because I'm ashamed of it, not because I have any qualms or, you know, anything like that, but it's simply because I don't want people to get the wrong impression and I don't want to speak ill of a profession that I hold in such high regard. But yeah, I think that most police officers have some level of PTSD and nobody's doing anything about it. And if they are, you know, more power to them, but it's really, really difficult in that line of work to discuss. I had this situation, I'm not going to talk about this specific situation, but it was a really shitty situation and it was really tragic and horrible and difficult. And it happened right at the beginning of the shift. So it was right as I kind of checked on duty and started to work. And it was really impactful. And after it was all said and done, because in the moment you work, right? In the moment you do what you need to do, you get the job done. And I did. And I, you know, everything, I did everything that I was supposed to do in that space. And I did it really well. But then afterwards, I sit back and I'm like, oh my God, like it hurt. Like I was in, uh, uh, a physical and emotional pain from that experience because of the trauma associated with it, from what I had to see and feel and deal with in that space. And, um, I remember going to my sergeant and being like, Hey, like, I don't feel good. Like, you know, I'm not, was I physically ill? No, I wasn't throwing up or anything like that, but I didn't feel good. I didn't feel right. And I wanted to leave for the night. I wanted to go home. I wanted to be done working for the day. And he's like, yeah, sorry, you can't, <laughs> you know, we're short. We don't have coverage, all those kind of things that exist and you can't go home. So I had to work the rest of the day, um, the rest of the 12 hour shift. It was a graveyard shift. I had to work the rest of the night in that space of feeling so kind of jacked up from that experience. So what you have to do in order to do that, and I shouldn't say have to, and I'm not judging other people and I'm not labeling or stereotyping. What I had to do in that experience was really disconnect from those feelings. So I'm not adequately processing them. I'm not adequately allowing them the space to kind of flow. I had to really disconnect and bury those feelings and then force myself into all of these other experiences and all these other spaces and all these other things that I had to handle throughout that shift. That's not a healthy way to process. <laughs> That's not a healthy way to exist. So, you know, I'm irritable. I'm grumpy. I'm upset. I'm frustrated. I'm you know, quick tempered or whatever the case may be. And I think a lot of times that's what we're seeing. And once again, this is why I hate talking about being a cop because we got listeners all over the world for the podcast. This is my experience, right? But I think a lot of times that's what we see portrayed people misunderstanding certain circumstances and experiences. It's not that police officers have anger issues. It's that police officers see things in very much. Do you know what I mean? clear cut. There's one way and that's it. And when things get in the way of that, they have a really difficult time processing that information. And a lot of times it's because they're so disconnected from their emotion and their feeling. Does that make sense? So do you think that because listening, it's very clear that that mindset is so almost polar opposite of what you have now. So in light of looking at things in, in a positive way and in a destined pathway, do you think that that is what was really, really just able to push you and help you find where you are now being in that space? And do you think that was really what lit the fire of desire for being like, I, I want the opposite of this. I want, cause now it's like I said, it's, it's night and day instead of this is one way it's, there's an infinite amount of possibilities or instead of trying to disconnect or constantly trying to connect even more so than you naturally are. And it, it just seems so, so completely contrasting. Yeah. Um, you know, it is on, you know, you can kind of look at it and see that it is really contrasting as far as kind of the way that I not just process emotion and life now, as opposed to when I was a police officer. 
um, my spiritual path and journey awakening, right? We talk about that on the podcast all the time. How did your journey and path kind of progress? And what was your kind of a, a tipping point where you woke up to all of these things? That happened while I was a police officer. <clears throat> Granted, I had experiences my whole life and all those type of things, but really the deep kind of dive into spirituality and energy and all that type of stuff happened when I was a police officer. And so I would have, it's like I would learn about concepts and their ideas, or I would start practicing meditation, or I would start to experiencing some things in the realm of spirituality and energy, and then I would have to go be a cop. And then I would start to see things and feel things and understand things and realize things and, you know, try to make those two worlds meet in a sense. And I think I did a pretty good job for quite some time. Yeah, that day that we came home to the, the massage table, you were still working full time <laughs> as, a, as a police officer. You'd get out of your uniform and get into like your robe and sitting on the, you know, no, the Now you make me stuff. sound weird. Oh, it's not, it, there's nothing wrong with the massage table and it's, you know, granted massages are wonderful and nice, but we also do other forms of energy work there sometimes. And that was when you were just kind of putting your toe in the water though. But yeah, like you were saying, it was just, it was, they were both happening at the same time. It wasn't like one stopped and one started. There was very much that intertwined for, for a while. Yeah. And they, they fed off of each other, like in a positive way, oh. right? Where, um, I really... You know, I, I think that I was, I think being a police officer was a wonderful thing for me. I think it benefited me in so many copious amounts of ways. And I think it also, um, kind of sped up my spiritual awakening in a sense, right? Because you start to learn about the concepts and ideas. And when I say learn, you know, we would go to the group with Alice and all that kind of stuff, right? We had Alice on the podcast however long ago, but start to be exposed to all these different thoughts and ideas and started to formulate my own belief system around them and my own understanding of them. And this idea that somehow energy exists out there and we can work with it, we can tap into it, we can feel it. And then I would go to work and very much feel energy. And now I have a uh, an understanding of it and a way to kind of process it. It's one of those common things, police officers, after they've been caught for a long time, not even that long, it doesn't take very long to get, but you get like a cop sense, you get a sixth sense for things where you pull over a car or you start talking to somebody or you walk into a, into a house or something like that and you can just feel something's off. So your cop sense kind of goes up and you get way more heightened awareness and you're way more um, prepared for whatever may happen. Well, that is directly correlated to vibrational energy that exists in your chakras connecting with that vibration. So starting to understand that and realize that and then kind of working with it in a sense, right? That was really, really neat. And that allowed me to kind of, like I said, fast forward my spiritual practice and experiences because I could take a concept and then see it and practice it and realize it much quicker and faster where it wasn't out there in the cosmos. It was very much real life, practical things that I was doing and experiencing. So that was really neat. Um, and that was really beneficial. Um, I could always find people, um, whether it was like, it wasn't ever anything super crazy. Like there was do you know what I mean? Somebody that had been kidnapped or abducted and had been gone missing for three months or something like that. We never had those type of cases that I had to deal with. But, you know, the kid that didn't come home from school and it was four hours later or um, all those type of situations. And a lot of times it was also trying to find somebody that we were looking for, somebody that we needed to question or somebody that needed to be arrested or something like that. I could always find them. And it's because I would go and find them. I would go and kind of feel and connect and listen. And when I had like that weird, subtle inkling to turn left, I would turn left or, you know, I'm going to get up and leave the office and head out and start patrolling now, as opposed to 15 minutes from now. Well, because I got up and left and went patrolling now, as soon as I pull out of the parking lot, that car that I was looking for drives right by. I could always do that on a regular basis. And that was really, really cool. 
And the more I brought awareness to that, and it wasn't like I was cocky about it or something like that. It was just understanding that if I listened to that, it worked, you know, I could consciously see that and have like cause and effect. So that was really, really neat. It was super beneficial. Completely different tone here. Um, something I just experienced for the very first time recently was a lucid dream. What was your first lucid dream? And like, were you already a hippie when it happened? Because I just imagine going through that without having like all these, you know, spiritual people. And I would have just been super confused as to, I mean, dreams are always super weird. But that one I woke up and I was like, what is going on? And it was so nice that I was able to go to you and be like, so this just happened. And I was making decisions when I was asleep, but I was like thinking and I knew things, but I was asleep. And you were kind of able to, you know, tell me that that was normal and talk about that a little bit. What was your first dream and how was your experience with that how was my first lucid dream i have no idea what my first lucid dream <laughs> you can't was. remember it's so no. monumental well i dreamt a lot when i was little <laughs> i remember very clearly having very so there's a difference between what we would describe so if i'm going to describe i would have lucid dreams meaning very clear and very kind of um tactile right um so I think there's a difference between having a very clear dream and a lucid dream. Um, so I would have a lot of really clear dreams as a kid, but then I also remember times of dreaming more than that clear dream. When I say clear, you understand what I mean, right? One of the early ones that I remember, um, I was a big fan of The Never Ending Story. Like one of my favorite movies growing up. What was the name of the character you were for Halloween numerous times? <laughs> that wasn't from the never ending story. No, the kid, his name starts with the A, the main Atreyu? character. Atreyu? Yes. I was never Atreyu for Halloween. Oh, I should have been. I was Wesley. Grandma made me a Wesley costume and I was Ralph Macho. You might have to be Atreyu next year just I to could totally be to Atreyu. We gotta get the hair. You've got the, yeah. Well, it's gonna get a little bit longer and we need a horse. I would totally Actually, be a traitor. Scratch, scratch that idea. I'm worried that I just inception something <laughs> It's bad. a wonderful idea. Um, but I remember having a dream. And do you remember in The NeverEnding Story, the medallion? Mm -hmm. It looked like snakes all swirly, right? Um, I remember in the dream having that medallion and seeing that medallion so vividly and so real that when I woke up and I didn't have it, I was panicked and I was so like kind of angry. And I remember having grandma like search my bed with me and I was tossing the blankets off and searching all over the place because I was so confident that it was real. That, that says a lot about the kind of mom grandma is that she's like, I'll help you look for your snake medallion. Yeah, like, yeah. <laughs> like if Maddie woke me up in the middle of the night, she's like, oh, I lost my Atreyu thing. And like, shh, <laughs> yeah, shh, go, go back to sleep. to sleep. But it was real. Like that's how convinced I was that when I woke up, I knew... Like, I just knew that I had it. So that was probably, I mean, I would describe that as a lucid dream where you wake up and I just knew that what I had just experienced was so real that it would exist when I was awake. <coughs> <coughs> but I've had so many dreams over the years. Do you know what I mean? And I still have them all the time. Uh, back on to a little bit more serious note, since we were talking about your, your hair. Um... Long, beautiful hair. We, we, we could debate that, but that's important <laughs> right now. Um, okay, so from, go again, kind of com this comparison here, as a police officer, that's a very respected line of work. I mean, right now there's a lot of controversy with it, but if we're just historically speaking, it's a very respected line of work. It's a very, you know, you strong people go into it, and the society as a whole typically is very grateful. And um, I am going to assume that evolutionary coaches maybe don't have that same you know just natural amount of respect from people do you feel like you've been treated differently in your life because instead of a uniform you have a jufro and a tote ring like do you feel like a jufro that's so terrible oh my god one two three <laughs> <laughs> yeah we're not editing that part out that part stayed in <laughs> Um, I think I'm definitely perceived differently now, obviously. Do you think that, like, do you feel like you get treated differently? Um, yes and no. Worse? Yes and no. I mean, it, it. the nice thing is, is at the end of the day, I don't care, right? It's that thing where, it, and it's not screw you society. I don't care. I'm going to be a rebel and do whatever the hell it is that I want to do. I'm just really content and happy with who I am. 
so it doesn't bother me to walk around with my crazy froey hair or my toe rings or i mean that's all silly stuff i mean that's the equivalent of do you know what i mean i don't care what you guys do to your hair it doesn't change who you are as people so i don't really care how society or how people view me or see me and of course the people that i mainly deal with or associate with or that are friends with or the people that i regularly come into contact with um it's just not, even longer than yeah, yours. a lot of times it's even longer than mine, but <laughs> you know, it doesn't, it doesn't matter in the end because the vast majority, and you know, it's interesting because like this whole thing now where I start to travel and I do all this stuff for green pod and all that kind of thing. Um, I still have this thing in my, cause I, I show up to go install these dream pods and I have my crappy clothes on because I'm going to go work, right? I have to go do something and get messy and silicone this and silicone that. And, so I don't show up in nice, suit and tie. Yeah, I don't show up in nice clothes. And <laughs> I show up but I've got this long hair and I've got my sandals on and I, you know, so I feel kind of bad on one hand, but then I feel like in the first 5 minutes of somebody meeting me they realize that I'm normal, they realize that I'm intelligent, that I, you know, I'm just this guy that happens to have long hair and you know. Do you feel like during your lifetime, we've Im- kind of improved in that respect. My my friends and I were actually discussing this the other day, how um how tattoos used to be a lot more taboo. And you could, you know, not get a job if your tattoo was showing. And it was a sign of, you know, almost like an intelligence or being trashy or all these just really negative stereotypes were attached. And now it's it's a much more regular thing. It's, almost, it's like a lot of, in some places a very rite of passage. You know, everyone in the family gets their sign or initial or so on and so forth. Do you feel like just during the course of your lifetime we've improved in that fashion or do you think it, that's kind of like a standard thing as far as judging on in those respects? Um, I think as a whole society <laughs> is evolving towards that perpetually, right? If only we had someone to coach us. <laughs> if only there was us. If, if only there was an evolution coach, hmm. what could we do? Um, but no, I think as a whole, we see that more and more, the acceptance of people for who they are and what they are. I mean, you see it across the board, not just with tattoos or with long hair, but sexual preference and uh, lifestyle choices. And do you know what I mean? You see that so many more uh, prevalently, prevent, prevalently, what's the word? Smart child of mine. Uh, where, where are you going with this? I, prevent, it's much more prevalent. Oh, there you go. There you go. It's much more prevalent now. Um, <laughs> So I think that society as a whole is changing in that regard. I think a lot of times it feels like we're still stuck, but I think that's because of the way that people portray it. And when I say people, I mean like the media and all of those type of things when it comes to what we are exposed to. I think they expose us to the things where it looks like we're more stuck when the reality is we're not. I think as a whole, society is in that fast-paced evolutionary state of acceptance of all things. They just choose to show us the places that we're not. Well, another argument could just be that now we have so much more access to the places that we're not. Whereas in decades past, you wouldn't really know what was going on. You only know what, you know, what the leaders or whatever have elected to show you. Whereas now there's so many, we're all so connected Mm-hmm. that it's much more clear to see those bad places, those those dark things that are still happening, unfortunately. Yeah. And for whatever reason, too, like <coughs> the media, the news, all that kind of crap, they just show that stuff. Do you know what I mean? That was I, was, I had this thought the other day where, I mean, it's so easy to get on Facebook and watch positive video after positive video after look at this guy that's going out and giving homeless people haircuts. Look at these people that are, you know, created some amazing way to get water for Africa. Here's three and a half hours of a kitten. Yeah. (laughs) But there's so much of that that you can view online. And then we go and turn on the news and it's just shit. It's just war. It's just destruction. It's just sadness. It's just homicide. It's just chaos. I have no idea why it's like that. There's some part of like the big conglomeration of media that exists out there, that that's the way that they operated for a very, very long time. And that's the way that they still operate. So I think eventually they'll evolve. I mean, if you think about too, like who watches TV anymore? Nobody watches TV anymore. You know, you guys are growing up in a, in a place, in a space right now where 
you know, your kids aren't going to watch um, ABC. They're not going to watch NBC. Your kids aren't going to tune into, you know, Modern Family on Wednesday nights because regular broadcast television won't exist anymore. Well, even our life, like I remember watching The Office, you know, Thursday nights. And then uh, last week or so, we were watching the the Fox uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show. And a commercial came on and we all kind of looked around like, like what, what, is, what, is, what is this? <laughs> What's happening? Aren't we? Can I push a button to yeah. make this go away? Yeah. Where's the... I don't watch television with commercials anymore. We don't. It's all, you know, Netflix or Apple TV or... Mm-hmm. I mean, worst case scenario, you can fast forward. But this was just live. We had to just yeah. watch three minutes of our life just drain away. And it was very... Stephanie. But it was funny because that's how it always was before, you know? Yeah. We had to do that with The Walking Dead. We had, uh, cause it was the big season premiere and it was a super good episode and we couldn't stream it yet. So we had to jump online and stream it through like AMC's actual website as opposed to Apple TV or something like that. And because you're watching it through their actual website, then of course they give you commercials and we're like, what the hell? Like, this is so painstakingly. They want us to watch this for two minutes and 30 seconds. I know. Think of it's all ridiculous. the better things you could do with two minutes exactly. and 30 seconds. I'm missing out on whatever the hell's happening in Walking Dead land. <laughs> but that's the way society is. You know, I think that you're, because I think about me at 17, way different than you at 17. Not just because we're different, but my life as a 17 year old, so different than what your life is. So it's exciting to think about your child and what their life is going to be like at 17. I mean, that's a really neat thing. I remember a time when we didn't have the internet. <laughs> You've never not had the internet. From the time that you were born, the internet existed. Yeah. It's only when I go back to like my, like super young that I can even remember slow internet. Mm-hmm. Like I have to think a little bit to think, and I can, like we had the actual computer with a monitor, like the the box, not yeah. just a laptop that you could, like it stayed in one place. Yeah. All the time. Yeah, those and you are had to, like, desktops. Boot it on and like, yeah, wait. but you don't even remember what slow internet was because slow internet for you was not really what slow internet was. Now it's like if I have to wait more than an actual second, I get mm-hmm. and you don't know what dial up was. You know, like a landline, like a phone that you actually had a cord connected to. I'm that sure you've seen awesome. those and you can remember those. <laughs> I actually, uh, at work, we have one in the hostess stand. And I break it very regularly because I just put it up to my ear and start walking around doing things because I have these things to do. I can't just stand in one place and be on the phone and waste my time. What is this? And then I hear it crash a couple minutes later and it's, oh, yeah, that's, it's connected to the wall. Oh, I I've lost so much. connection with the customer. This was fun. <laughs> it happens at least once a weekend. I'm going to be completely honest. Well, Miha, hmm. This has been wonderful. That was way fun. Make sure you take out my uh, politically incorrect <laughs> My Jew pro, it's staying in there. It's going to be the tagline really for the episode. It really just reflects on your personality that you <laughs> brought up a daughter who says that. An awesome <laughs> daughter that has a wonderful respect for I listen to cultures. Ira Glass and I watch Jon Stewart, so I'm pretty sure I'm allowed to say. Uh, <laughs> Cult, what is it? Uh, cultural misappropriation or something like that. Sounds great. Yeah. Mm. But thank you. Yeah, thank you. This has been lovely. So you gotta get closer to the mic. I keep reminding you. Sorry. Um, at the end of the episode, you give the guests the opportunity to throw out all their stuff. Okay. Guest, <laughs> I'm gonna go ahead and give you the opportunity. Hang on, hang on. Let me make that sound a little better. <clears throat> Mr. <clears throat> Mr. Salazar, it has been so lovely to have you on this podcast with me. And just before we go. I wanted to ask, do you have anything you want to put out to our listeners? You know, maybe some advertisements, upcoming events, things like that you'd like to share with us? Yeah, thank you. Uh, I really appreciate the opportunity. First and foremost, it's been wonderful getting to chat with you. Um, I absolutely love your podcast and what you're doing. I think it's an amazing thing. Um, obviously, people can find all of the episodes for the Energy is Love podcast at energyislovepodcast.com. Um, this was a cool thing. This was episode 50. What else do we have coming up for the podcast? I don't know. I don't. I never know what we have coming up. I do have a cool interview that's coming up, hopefully, when we go to California at the end of the month. I'll tease it a little bit, but I don't want to talk too much about it because I don't know for sure if it's a done deal. But it Sounds like everybody has to stay tuned then. Yeah, stay tuned. And you can obviously find Steph and I stuff online, our Facebook page for Evolution Coaches, um, 
on the actual podcast website, there's information about that as well. You just click on the Craig and Steph tab, but I probably promo. You guys have a tab? We do. We That's pretty a, rad. We have a little, a little section on the podcast or on the website, but everybody that listens to the podcast knows all this shit because I talk about it all the time. So. Am I allowed to swear on the podcast? You can if you'd like. It is a... That's the beauty of a podcast. I wish I'd have known that going in. <laughs> <laughs> this would have been way different. I'm just the whole thing. <laughs> but thank you. Yes, thank you. And, and we always sign off the podcast with, now everybody go out and have a beautiful, wonderful day. So go ahead and share. Let me see if I can connect with my inner Ira Glass. Make mm-hmm. this like really just motivational. Video. Make sure you stay close <laughs> to the mic when you say it. Now everybody, go out and have a beautiful, wonderful day. Thank you. Energy is neither created nor destroyed. I believe everything is the now and the present and the moment. Spirituality is just realizing that it's all the same but under different names. But in the end, it's it's up to the person, right? It's up to the individual to make the choice to change and embrace that evolution that's going on so that they can really reach their highest potential.